Hello, this is Dr. Irene Housinger, and this lecture will cover Chapter 6 of your Babor book, Drug Policy in the Public Good, Legal Markets, Diversion of Pharmaceuticals. Diversion means to take something that was intended to go to one place and making it go to another place. So, for example, a common drug crime is diversion that you'll see happens in hospitals. And so you may have clients that were caught diverting pills so or um, injectables. So maybe you have a client, let's say that they're a nurse and they become addicted to prescription pills and so they start stealing those pills from the hospital. That act of stealing is called diversion, a diversion of a controlled substance. It's very common, and in our state of Washington and in other states, there are impaired provider programs that will help medical professionals, among others, maintain their license if they are able and willing to go to treatment, get random UAs, and follow whatever probationary decisions that the Department of Health puts into place. Generally, it's for a period of three to five years. So let's look at pharmaceutical markets. Pharmaceutical markets pose interesting challenges in ethics, legality, and market relations between legal markets and illegal markets. Pharmaceuticals can be bought and sold in normative legal markets. Pharmaceuticals can be bought and sold in illegal street markets. There are more policy options available to prevent diversion to illegal markets than there are for drugs that are illegal to begin with. So looking at a brief history of the pharmaceutical industry, and in no way complete, up until the mid-1900s, so again, we see all these changes happening between 1914 and 1918 in the United States. Up until that point in time, most pharmaceuticals were compounded or created or mixed by physicians and apothecaries right before selling to the patient. We do still have compounding pharmacies. There is the Union Ave Compounding Pharmacy in Tacoma. And they will do this. They will mix your medications for you with the raw ingredients and then call you and tell you when it's ready. So this model still exists. Um, prior to this point in the 1900s, there, there, weren't, uh, there were apothecaries, certainly, but a lot of this took place in doctors' offices. And so doctors would sell their medications directly to patients. Um, and in some cases, this is actually occurring again. There is a group of uh, doctors of movement that are really against big pharma. And what they are doing is they're taking samples and they're taking the medications that are given to them by big pharma at cost or sometimes given as samples, but also sold to them at cost. And they are selling them directly to patients um, to mitigate that so that they don't have the inflation with the pharmaceutical company. Um, there are two main trends for pharmaceuticals. Pharmaceuticals were centralized within the manufacturing of chemicals, and then there was an increase in patent medications, which were super secret mixtures of questionable effectiveness that led to the monopolization of what is now the pharmaceutical industry. So I'm sure you're familiar with the term patent secret. Well, this is really what we had, this concoction of different formulas that led to the model that we have today. Looking at the global pharmaceutical industry, Big Pharma is generally concentrated in higher income countries and it continues to rise in profit. This week on your Moodle module, there is a link to a healthcare site and it discusses how pills and medications are much more expensive in the US and the deals that we have with the pharmaceutical companies. I highly encourage you to check it out. There's some great numbers in there. It discusses what is pharmaceutical research, how much profit are they making, how much does it cost to make the medications, and why is there such a huge markup here. Pharmaceuticals come and go in waves. In the 1800s and early 1900s, it was very common to have these concoctions made with cocaine, alcohol, morphine, and opium. If you Google um, nerve tonic from the 1900s, you're going to see these old school bottles and they might have cannabis in them as well. And they had all these concoctions um, <clears throat> that gave way with regulation to the chloral hydrates and bromides. 
more classical psychiatric drugs that are not really used very much today were the barbiturates, which um, had pretty significant side effects. And um, those were um, kind of pushed to the side in favor of benzodiazepines. So we do have a history of replacing substances with other substances, whether they become dangerous or brain science evolves, et cetera. Um, in the 1990s, SSRIs, antidepressants, and the psychostimulants such as Ritalin became very popular. And then as we know now, even 20 years later, uh, and we're still reeling from this, opiates and opioids were really kind of the in vogue medications. We have waves of drugs and drug classes, and they come and go for a variety of reasons. One classification gives way to another due to correcting past problems. So with the relationship of um, morphine and heroin, you know, cocaine was sometimes used to treat that. So we would have you know, a stimulant treating a depressant. Uh, allopathic physicians, that's the Western style of medication uh, physician of doctor we have today. Um, brain science evolution and the influence of the advertising industry all play a part in this. Marketing shifted from making medications to patients in psych hospitals to the medicalization of everyday ailments. So basically what they did is they would create medical problems that were based off of just being a person and then create a medication for it. So restless leg syndrome, PMDD, low testosterone, etc. A person's testosterone level will drop as they age. It's not a syndrome. It's part of being a person. Um, the film American Addict discusses the relationship between Big Pharma and the government and also the advertising companies largely in terms of how uh, we are being marketed to for medical problems. Historically, there was a lack of marketing to the general public, and this is something that is still highly contested, and it's covered under uh, free speech in the U.S. The U.S. and New Zealand um, are, are really the only nations that have DTC, direct-to-consumer advertising. And the U.S. consumes at least 10 times the per capita of global consumption of psychostimulants. So it's not a stretch that we have such a huge consumption here of pharmaceuticals of all different types, especially psychostimulants um, and benzodiazepines and, of course, opiates. But we are being marketed to directly. Um, so people see commercials or ads on the internet and then they go in to their doctor and they ask them for these medications, whereas previously that did not happen. So there certainly is an ethical issue here. Is it ethical to market to people that don't have medical knowledge? Um, and what is the, you know, what are the ramifications of that? If you look at the drug ads, many times the side effects are way worse than what they are um, trying to combat. For example, there was a medication a couple years ago that I saw on television called Ragatech, and it was supposed to help ragweed allergies. If you're allergic to ragweed, you know what that feels like. Your eyes swell up, runny nose, basic you know, uh, spring, summer allergies. The side effect of this was respiratory arrest. I will take itchy eyes over respiratory arrest. Right. The global consumption of prescription pharmaceuticals continue. There are differences between countries, and these can be attributed to the affluence of the country, cultural uh, specificities, and the social influence of pharmaceutical marketing. There are some charts on page 98, 100, and 101 for differences between countries where you can see these trends. Largely, uh, the United States <clears throat> consumes a lot of the benzodiazepines uh, and the psychostimulants, whereas um, other countries such as uh, South Africa and Pakistan do not consume nearly as much. So you're going to see a lot more with um, largely de developed um, countries. However, um, if you look at the chart, it's really interesting. 
you're looking at the uh, the first category there above sedatives and hypnotics the annex uh, uh, let's pronounce this annex elytics that's probably not right but those are your uh, your bed your benzos are in that category uh, France consumes a lot more than the United States and Japan does not. So there definitely are uh, cultural values and um, things that are going on that would make a country more likely to consume. Um, one of those things in the United States, especially for the psychostimulants, would be the increase of diagnoses of kids and adults with ADD and ADHD that has largely contributed to the massive increase in the consumption of those psychostimulants. Within drug markets, we have a normative legal market where our patient would go to the doctor, the doctor would write a prescription, and then the patient would go to the pharmacist and the pharmacist would give that to the patient. It's regulated based off of legal prescriptions. Unregulated markets have multiple sources of procurement, which makes it a little bit more complicated. There's informal sourcing, which is usually from friends and family. It could be leftover medication in home. And your book talks about um, the overprescribing of medication to veterans and how many veterans don't use their pills. Um, leftover medication in the home. This could be uh, sharing, borrowing, selling, or trading. Okay. I just sometimes, you know, sharing and giving. Um, diversion from healthcare sources. Several different things could happen here. There could be leakage, what a nice politically correct word to describe this, from stocks of unused medications. Doctor shopping, which is where a patient will go to multiple doctors and then multiple pharmacies to get their pills. In Washington state, we have a prescription monitoring program and not all states do participate in this. It is up to the state. And it monitors the patients, so there's a database, so if uh, it'll pop up if you're going to multiple pharmacies to get these medications. And same thing with doctors, they are monitored very closely now in Washington as far as how many of each type of medication are they prescribing, and if they're prescribing too many opiates or if they're prescribing things that look suspicious, then they, it could go to the point of having your medical license revoked. And then healthcare provider collusion, which would be a healthcare provider diverting the substances or um, forging things, etc. Um, we have diversion crimes and drug markets. There is a relationship between the legal and illegal drug markets. So things that are legally procured can be then diverted and sold illegally. Legal drugs can become diverted uh, and often sold in the street markets and it is not uncommon for individuals who can't afford their prescriptions or who have run out to seek prescriptions in a street market. For example, in the United States, our healthcare system isn't so fantastic. It can take six weeks or more to get a medical appointment for mental health. You can go and find a street dealer and buy Xanax or whatever you want in an hour. So I'm going to wait six weeks or... Am I going to go and try to find something and self-medicate? Okay. Um, I've actually heard healthcare providers tell patients, well, you should just maybe drink and smoke pot until you get a healthcare appointment because when you're, if you're that anxious, you have to do something. Um, wow. Self-medicate with alcohol because getting a mental health appointment is too difficult. So um, I bring this up because we need a major overhaul of our healthcare system. Um, and although um, it, we definitely do have a prescription pill problem, um, and this model in the 1950s and 60s, there was more of a psychosocial model with talk therapy. Um, and then from the 80s onward, it became very much about managed healthcare and an outpatient setting. And... Uh, we're still we're still feeling the effects of that, and that is one of the theories behind why we have such a huge homeless population, largely with so many people that have mental health problems. Is earlier on in this country, we had bigger psychiatric hospitals, and people like Western State, and people would go there for six months or a couple of years, or maybe 
never get to leave. Um, but then they would go home if they could when they were stabilized. Um, with the shuttering of so many of these across the country, there's no place for chronically mentally ill people to go. Um, hospital beds can't take you for that long. So one of the theories is that we've created the American homeless problem by shuttering these mental health institutions. It's most commonly these pills are um, being diverted from older individuals and chronic pain patients, especially if older individuals um, have younger caretakers that might be involved in nefarious things. That is something that's it's very common or older individuals that aren't using their pills or might not be keeping track. It could be easy to divert from there. Um, and there can be some Medicare fraud in there as well. It's not uncommon um, for people to buy pills and then uh, from older individuals that get them basically for free and then sell them in a market. Diversion crimes and drug markets continued. Property crimes and thefts can be attributed to this as well. With pharmacy robberies, um, it's not uncommon for people's homes to be broken into and medicine cabinets raided. They can be stolen from distribution facilities. And then there are internet-based procurements. There are legal prescription pharmacies. Let me tell you a story. My cat and I both have asthma. And with insurance, my inhaler is $300. Without it, it's $500. I found a legal pharmacy based in Canada, Northwest Pharmacy. And I uploaded my prescription. Um, and this is how you do it. You click on, is this for a person or is this for an animal? And then you email or fax them your legal prescription. And then they tell you how much the medication is going to be cost. And then the medication is sent to you outside of the U.S. So mine came from Singapore and it was $90. So $90 with the prescription from Canada. And I got it from Singapore versus... $500 without insurance or $300 with insurance. Nowadays, we have this good RX service that's coupons, and sometimes the coupons are less expensive than your insurance. There is an incident as well of people buying their legally prescribed drugs illegally on the internet just because they can't afford it even if they have insurance. So this absolutely is, again, part of the healthcare crisis that we have in the United States. Then we have crypto markets. Um, I had mentioned the Silk Road. The Silk Road has been shut down, but there are other markets like it on the dark dark web. Um, the Silk Road largely catered towards um, cannabis when it was illegal and psychedelics. Um, however, um, people sometimes do find that it is less expensive to buy things on the dark web, even if they have a legal prescription for it. And then in some cases, there are counterfeit medications. The research on this is pretty sparse, but it's mostly related to opiate-like medications. Thank you, and I'll see you next week.